Hello, my name's uh, Dr. Amar Shah and I'm a NIHR a Long COVID Clinical Fellow and we just wanted to do a short introduction uh, to um, welcome you to the, the first national uh, Long COVID webinar that we had uh, on the 16th of February, uh, the recording of which is now uh, available uh, on the NIHR website. The idea behind this webinar was to bring, a, bring together research teams from across the country to facilitate and engage um, in discussions about Long COVID uh, research and to promote uh, long COVID research, as well as to think about uh, future directions of travel uh, in this area. And we're really grateful that uh, all of you could join us today. I'll now hand over to Dr. Swapna Mandal. Thanks, Amar. I'm Dr. Swapna Mandal, a consultant respiratory physician. We uh, were very excited to have been joined by so many participants, but also very excited by our speakers. Um, who were able to present and share their data with us. We'll now move on to the first talk. Thanks for future research studies and clinical trials. Now, it was clear from very early in the pandemic that although the initial infection was respiratory, uh, COVID, COVID was often affecting other organs and systems. And the design of the study itself was intended to build on a patient-centred and holistic clinical follow-up and to collect data across multiple health domains to enable evaluation of the full potential spectrum of effects of the virus on the body. And we organised our research strategy around different domains with the intention that this would facilitate efficient coordination of research both within domains but also cross-talk across different domains. Multiple charities have been involved in the study uh, both in the setup and the research strategy and in early 2021 we undertook a research priority setting exercise with patients and researchers which has directly informed allocation of resource within the study and allowed us to make sure that the study delivers on research questions that are of key importance to those experiencing the long-term effects of COVID. So the FOSP COVID study has three tiers. Tier one is electronic data collection only with participants consenting to long term access to their medical records and to be recontacted for future studies and trials. Tier two builds on tier one, but participants also attend a research visit. Uh, this is for additional data collection, including physical tests and measures, questionnaires and to provide biological samples for research. And tier three in FOSP refers to studies whereby participants are recontacted to take part in additional research studies. So this figure illustrates the participant journey for tier two. So following discharge, eligible participants are contacted by phone to take part. If they agree, they attend research visits at three to six months and 12 months after discharge. And these visits are timed where possible to align with routine clinical follow up visits and data gathered from both appointments to avoid duplication. To date, we've recruited over 7,000 participants with around 2,700 of those being in that tier two. And this is across 83 sites and top recruiting sites for each tier are shown here in this figure. So the, <coughs> oh, excuse me, uh, there are multiple research questions being addressed and at various stages using the FOSP COVID data, but not enough time to show all of them here. So I'm going to focus on an overview of our main findings to date that relate to overall recovery characteristics of the cohort as described in these two publications, one of this, one of which is still a preprint and is currently under peer review. So these are the numbers and characteristics of the participants included in the analysis. So we have over 2,300 with a visit at around five months and over 900 who have undertaken a visit at around 12 months after hospital discharge. Our cohort have an average age of 59, a third are females and a quarter received invasive mechanical ventilation and over half were obese. Our participants were asked, do you feel fully recovered? To which they could answer yes, no or unsure. And you can see that only around one in three felt fully recovered at five months and this hadn't changed by 12 months post discharge. Even when we made some extreme assumptions about the impact of selection bias at 12 months, we found that a very significant proportion of participants would still be feeling unrecovered at 12 months. We looked at the risk factors associated with being less likely to feel recovered at 12 months and found that being female, obese and having received invasive mechanical ventilation during the acute admission were all significantly associated. And this is very similar to our findings from the five month data. 
We were also able to look at whether receiving steroids during admission, which showed a clear effect on survival of COVID-19 itself, had an effect on recovery and we didn't yet find an association. When we compared the overall cohort characteristics between five and 12 months, we found that there was minimal overall improvement in symptoms, with one in four patients still reporting symptoms of anxiety and depression, and one in 10 with symptoms of PTSD. There were some small improvements in walking distance and the occurrence of brain fog, but there were still one in 10 participants or patients with clinically relevant cognitive impairment. Using data from validated questionnaires for breathlessness, fatigue, anxiety, depression, cognition, and also physical tests at five months, we performed a clustering analysis that identified four recovery clusters and that are shown here in this figure with increasing severity of the domains listed on the left on the vertical axis and severity of brain fog on the horizontal axis. And the key characteristics of individuals in each of these clusters are shown in the table. And you can see that consistent with the risk factors for self-perceived recovery, the clusters with more severe ongoing impairment have higher percentages of females, of individuals with BMIs indicative of obesity, and also report more symptoms, poorer performance in physical tests, and raised CRP, which is a widely measured marker of inflammation. Of note is the very severe, red, severe cluster in red with high severity of symptoms and impairments and moderative cognitive impairment. And this cluster shown in green, which sits apart from the other clusters for its increased severity of cognitive impairment. Our participants kindly allowed us to take blood samples for research and using these we were able to perform analyses of inflammatory blood proteins, comparing each of the very severe, severe and moderate clusters with the mild clusters. And these analyses identify 13 inflammatory proteins that were elevated in individuals in the very severe cluster and two that were elevated in the moderate and cognitive cluster, even after adjustment for factors such as age, BMI, comorbidities, etc. And these findings start to give us mechanistic insight into why we see some individuals having worse recovery outcome than others. Our participants had also provided uh, questionnaire answers that allowed us to score their quality of life pre-COVID at five months after discharge and at 12 months. And this is this, these are the results stratified by the same four clusters. And you can see that post-COVID scores are consistently lower across all clusters with more marked differences for the more severe clusters. And furthermore, there's very little change in these scores between the five months and 12 months uh, post-discharge time points. So to summarise, in our cohort of individuals who have been hospitalised for COVID-19, we see that only one in three felt fully recovered at 12 months, with female sex, obesity and invasive care being significant risk factors for not feeling recovered. Using blood protein data, we identified an association between specific inflammatory proteins and the degree and nature of ongoing impairment at five months. Overall, and when looking at recovery clusters, there was minimal change in health status between five months and 12 months. And our data highlight an urgent need for treatment and healthcare support and also indicate that a one size all approach is unlikely to be the optimal approach given the different recovery trajectories we're seeing. And we highlight persistent systemic inflammation, obesity and reduced physical function as potential modifiable targets for consideration in a precision medicine approach to treatment for ongoing COVID uh, problems. So, FOSB is still recruiting and research visits are ongoing, but this phase will draw to an end at the end of March and our efforts will then focus on QCing and locking down the full data set and conducting the full cohort analyses. There are multiple grants and studies that have utilised the FOS platform, including large acute phase studies such as ISARIC and focused immunological efforts that have utilised the FOSB research visits and samples to follow up findings from the acute phase data sets. There are more than 15 groups accessing the valuable cross-sectional and longitudinal biological samples that we have and linkage to imaging, which is both clinical and research, is ongoing. We have consent to follow up participants for up to 25 years and are linking to routine primary and secondary care data to enrich the data set through capture of prospective and retrospective uh, information. And importantly, we recognise that our cohort focuses on a relatively small subset of all of those affected by COVID, uh, those that were hospitalised. And so we're engaging with other long COVID studies, uh, particularly those with community COVID, both nationally and internationally for collaborative research. Finally, huge thanks go to our study participants, uh, to individuals living with long COVID who have shaped our research strategy and to the charities and PPI teams who've supported this. 
This has been a really intensive research study, often under difficult conditions, and it's still ongoing. And there's much appreciation of the dedication of the research teams at the different sites that have participated. Thanks also to our various boards, committees and groups, uh, to our funders, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Professor Wayne. That's a really um, interesting talk and interesting data coming out of FOSP COVID. Um, as you can imagine, we've had a lot of interest about the inflammatory proteins that you have identified. Are you able to give us any more information on those and whether they have given you a specific target for therapeutics? Yeah, so all of the so all of the information that I presented is available in the preprint that I showed um, and I, I can pop that in the chat when I finish talking, but of particular notes and that will be familiar to many, we saw IL-6 uh, raised uh, in, in the very severe cluster and also interestingly in that sort of moderate cognitive impairment cluster as well. And there were a number of other markers, particularly, re particularly relating to uh, damage, uh, tissue damage and repair, which is kind of not unexpected, but yes, yeah, I'm really interested interesting biological stories coming out. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wayne, uh, for a really interesting uh, talk. There were some questions uh, just asking about how uh, patients were actually selected for the patients uh, for the study. So how the hospitalised patients were uh, selected and why only hospitalised patients and, and not other COVID sufferers. Yeah, so the, the remit of the funding that we received was very much um, around recruiting participants uh, who were hospitalised and maximising our resources to recruit as many as we possibly could and to develop a really rich phenotypic data set. Um, at the outset, we felt that this may be enriched for individuals who may who may have longer term effects of COVID. I think it's become clear that actually the initial severity um, isn't directly related to how well you will recover after. So obviously that's something that we've learned along the way. Um, individuals were selected at sites by um, by the local site, knowing who had been in hospital and discharged with a COVID positive result. So everybody that they could invite, they invited um, individuals that weren't invited to take part in our tier two with the additional research and samples were invited to also had the option of taking part in tier one where they didn't actually have to physically come back, but we could collect data on them um, from their records and also with this uh, longer term follow up. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. We've got lots of other questions coming in the into the chat. We may, um, if you're staying, ask you about some of those a bit later. Thank you. We'll move on to our next talk now. Thank you.